morning again. Good to see everybody. Um, so it probably looks a little bit weird with me sitting down. Uh, a couple reasons for that. It's not just because I'm lazy. Um, but um, we decided, I've got Gary laid out marks here. You notice my, our lights are a little bit messed up. So I'm trying to stay in the light today so everybody can kind of see me and I don't wander too much. And I told Gary, I said, well, you know, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to sit there. Because that's the only way that you can keep me from talking with my hands and I talk with my feet. So I'm all over the place. Uh, if, if those of you that have been here and, and have, uh, have seen me speak uh, before. But, um, but anyway, we're going to be in James 4 today. So if you want to turn there now, uh, go ahead and uh, continue our series in James, The Faith That Works. And before we get into that, I, I do kind of, I don't, I don't normally do this, but I do want to kind of give a little bit of a plug for next week. Um, I really want to encourage everyone to be here next week. I know it's Memorial Day weekend and all that, but, but we're, we're doing something different next week with, uh, with the message. We've actually got, I guess the, the only way that I can term it is we've got a really big announcement to make. And it's something that for our church is, is huge for our church. And so really, I guess a couple of announcements, but, um, but it's going to be a little different. I'm going to have some friends up here with me. I'm not going to be going solo next week on the, on the message. We're going to have some, have some of my uh, compadres up here with me next week. Um, Eric and Gary and Bobby and I don't know, we may have some more people up too. You never know. But uh, it's going to be a little bit different. So we, I just want to encourage you. I know that's a, that's a really bad thing to do to like tease people like that and say, Got a big announcement, but it's going to be a week from now. But, uh, but I just want you to know, and, and if you've been investing in, in talking with someone about possibly coming next week, please invite them, because they're going to want to hear what God is doing uh, in our church, in our community. And this is something that, um, that and you'll see next week, this is something that we, a lot of us have been praying about, the deacons and the leadership, for a long time. And uh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a tremendous impact on where we go as a church and some of us it's going to have a tremendous impact individually. So um, just be praying about that this week. Uh, we, I'm definitely, like I said, just encourage you to come back next week and, and be here. Uh, this is, um, I mean, there's no other way. That sounds silly, a really big announcement. It's either a big announcement or it's not a big announcement, but, um, but that's the best way I can describe it. So that's next week. So we're really excited about that. Uh, so anyway, I just want to say that. So that's going to be the final week of our Faith at Work series. And we're continuing on in our series. Um, one, of the, one of the big things about this series, one of the things that we try to do is we try to, to get the things that are in our head and actually, um, actually get them to, to manifest themselves through our feet and through our hands. That makes sense? We're really trying to get ourselves to take, you know, if we just sit and listen all the time, if we just sit and take information in, I talked about this a few weeks ago, if we just sit and take that information in, really kind of what good is that, is that doing for us? Right? We, we want to we we live these things out. That's the title of the series, Faith That Works. And, and, and when, we, when, we, uh, when we learn, when we, we, we grow in our faith, when we grow in our understanding of what it is that God's will is for us, we want to see those things manifest themselves. And truly, that's what life transformation is really about. That's when our life really becomes transformed is when we, when we take in these things in and we begin to let those things guide our lives. Right? We started out talking about the Bible as a mirror, and about looking at the Bible, letting it reflect back to us who we are so that we can get a true picture. Because so many things that we try to, I guess, compare ourselves to in the rest of the, in the, rest of the world really don't make sense, right? I mean, we compare ourselves to the world. The world's, the world's view is changing all the time. If we compare ourselves to our friends, we're, we're comparing ourselves to, to sinful people so that there's, there's only really one true way to reflect who we are and, and where we want to be as a, as a Christian, as a believer, and that's to, to use the Bible as that, that mirror for us. And we talk, we've also talked about, in our daily interactions with other folks, about showing everyone worth, making sure that everyone understands that, that, that they, are, they are loved by God, as Gary was talking about before, um, the, the love that God has for us, and He's always there, but we've got to make sure that we show everyone the, the value and the worth that God puts in them. And then last week, Eric did a phenomenal job talking about our words and how our words can, can build us up or tear us down. I'm glad he got that one because if, if I would brought a hammer up here, y'all would realize that was terrible because I can't do anything with a hammer. But, um, but, but our words are so impactful to people and how we use our words and, and, we, and we can bless people or we can tear people down with our words. So in each of those, those are things that, that places that we really want to get. But, but I guess the question becomes, how do we, how do we get there? I mean, I mean, really, how do we get 
to that place in our lives? How is it that we get to the place that, that, that what's in our head that we know is actually working in our lives? You know, I, I, I say that, I'll be honest with you, um, and, and this is kind of another reason, I guess, and I thought about this this week, so it's kind of ironic that we had the light issue. Um, a former pastor that I had did this one time, you know, sometimes when, when we sit down as a pastor, you know, I'm kind of like talking to myself a lot, which I am every week, but, but in this particular one, I really think, you know, I should, I should be sitting and listening to this sometimes because, because I struggle with this a lot, with taking what I know is in my head and actually applying it into my life. How do I, how do I make it real? You ever, you ever get to that point? You ever get to that point where you feel that conflict in your life? I know I have. I mean, on a regular basis, I get to that place. I get to that point where there's a conflict. There's just this unresolved conflict in my life. And I know what I've learned. I know what I've, what I've seen. I know what I, how, I should, how, how, how God has, has shown me that I should live. But then there's this, this conflict, and I can't quite get to that place. It's kind of like uh, one of the things that I battle with is, you know, and I've used this example before, but it's something I battle with is eating. Right? You get to that place and think, gosh, you know, should I really get that, that second? Right? Should I, should I get that? No, I shouldn't. Right? Or should I, should I eat that second piece of cake? Right? Um, I, had a, I had an incident with a big piece of chocolate cake this week that I probably shouldn't have had. Right? I should have stopped halfway through. And I could, I would have been fine to stop halfway through. But, but I've always been told, clean your plate. Right? So i got to eat everything off my plate. And, and probably shouldn't have done that. But, but that's one of those things. It's just, it's second nature for me. That's, that's, a, that's a life habit that I have. It's something that's hard to break. And I think many times in our lives, um, it, it, we realize that the behaviors that we want to change sometimes are very different, difficult, and we get into those conflicts. You know, I get to the place, and I do this a lot, and I'll admit this, and, and Carrie will remind me of this after I say this publicly, um, but, but I get to that place, I feel guilty a lot of times with eating, right? I feel guilty when I eat too much sometimes, but it's just... It's second nature. It's a habit. It's my. It's the way I just typically behave. I know what I should do, and then I don't do it, and then I'm kind of in this conflict in my mind, and I feel bad about it, and I feel bad after it has taken place. Um, one of the things you know that, that makes me feel a lot better is that James actually addresses uh, a lot of this in chapter four, and he kind of he takes us from that place of this conflict, and then he he sort of brings us to where I want to go in this message today about how we draw close. To God and how that helps us live out that faith that works. Um, he, he shows us this by isolating an issue that keeps people from getting to the place of resolving that conflict. Really resolving that conflict within our lives. And um, we're going to start at verse one. Start right at the beginning of, of the chapter. And we're going to look at verses kind of in, in a little bit of chunks here, and, and, and you'll see kind of where I'm going. But we're going to set this up in the first three verses. Talking about that conflict, understanding where that conflict actually is in our lives and, and where this comes from. So we'll start there in verse 1. It says this, and read along with me. I think it should be up there. It should be up on the screen here. Um, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. Now, remember, we talk about this each week. The people that, that James is writing to here, these are people who are believers. They are Christians. Okay? And, and so he's, he's giving them information, trying to help them living out, living through their faith. And one of the things that was going on at this time, there's, there's some debate in different commentaries about, you know, why the, the symbolism of the fights and the quarrels and things. But there's a couple different things going on. The people this time were, were one, they were, they were actually, in some cases, creating fights. There were, there was, there were um, uh, insurrections against the government at the time. And, and the, the Christians at the time, if people weren't converting, then many times they were thinking that, that they, could, they could, by force, uh, they, had, they had the right by force to, to attack or to fight with these people. The other thing, the other dynamic that's going on with James Rice is, is the different factions of the believers are actually quarreling amongst each other. They're, they're fighting amongst each other in a, in a way in terms of the different areas of belief or who, how, how people should be converted and different things. So there is a lot of strife and there, there are quarrels going on 
between them. And he makes the point here. He says, you know, what is it that causes these things? Does it not come from within you? And we can transfer that into our lives today and say, okay, what is it that, what is it that causes strife and, and fights today? What is it that causes people to be upset today? Well, typically it's because there's something that we want, something that we don't have, right? And, and then we, and then we, too many times we get upset or we or something, a way that we want someone to treat us and they're not treating us. And these things come from within us and so they create conflict, right? They create discord. Among us, he goes on to say, you know, you desire, but you do not have. You covet, but you cannot get. And then in verse three, he talks about asking. He says, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. And ultimately, the overarching theme in, in, in these verses, I think, is this: we're not satisfied. We're not satisfied with what God has provided us. We're not satisfied with God's provisions, and so we want more. And, and we think that we need to get more. You know, these Christians at the time, they, they wanted to have Jesus, right? And they wanted to have the world as well. And I think that that's something that probably all of us struggle with as well. We, we want Jesus, right? We want to have Christ in our life, and we want to live that life. But then we also see the world. And the thing about the world is, and you know, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. The world tells us that we should be the master of our own domain, Right? That we should have the things that we want. That, that no one should tell us what it is that we should have. That we, we that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole, I guess, I don't want to get too far into this, but, but this whole idea of accountability and, and different things. Um, the world really doesn't look at that in, in most cases as being valid. They believe that the world tells us that you should have things the way you want to have them. And so when, when we sitting here today, we battle that. We see Christ in our life and we take this information in and we understand what it is that we that we feel and what God's will is for us, but then the world tells us something different. And so we, we begin balancing these two areas as the people here that James is writing to. And then he goes on. And in verse 4 he gets really, really strong with his language to them. And, and there's, there's, there's about three key words in here that I'm going to point out when I come to them. And he really makes a strong statement here. He starts this in verse 4. It says, you adulterous people. Now, adulterous, that, that's a big word right there. He's, he's, he's hitting them strong right away. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, enmity excuse me, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Another strong word, an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Go back to that first. This, this idea that you adulterous people, they would, the people here at this time that he's writing to, they understand. They've seen Israel in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They saw them follow God, fall away from God, follow God, fall away from God. And basically what he's saying to them is you are an unfaithful you are unfaithful in your actions. You're unfaithful in the way that you live your lives, to what it is that I, have, that I have shown you, the way that you live your life. And then he goes on to call you call it an enemy of God. Now, I don't know about you, that's, that's hard to even say, right? That's hard for me to even say out loud that I'm an enemy of God. Because here's the thing. You can dislike somebody or, or somebody can dislike you, right? I mean, we've all got those probably. People probably don't like us that much. But, but, but to say that you dislike somebody, but then you call somebody an enemy, that has a whole different connotation. That's, that's someone who is in direct opposition to you. And what, and what James is saying here is, is because you try to be friends with the world and be friends with you can't have it both ways. And, and if, you're not, if you're not living, if you're not trying to, to, to live uh, God's will, if you're not doing those kinds of things, then you are an enemy <laughs> That connotation in my mind, that just, I mean, that, that just scares me to think about that, to think about the way, I mean, it just, it just it amazes me, that, that strong language there. Um, this kind of puts us, you know, it, it really shows us that this is not where we want to be. Think about the times in your life when these unresolved conflicts have come up. Think about many times the hopelessness that we have had in our lives. That's what this, that's what this conflict creates. It creates sort of a hopelessness, a despair, a brokenness in our lives because we, we, we feel this, we feel one way, we, we, we understand, but then, but then these things aren't happening in our lives. And so we have this conflict and we feel broken and we feel, we feel hopeless many times. 
So how do we get out from under this conflict? How do we, how do we step? How do we, how do we take that step and get away from the unresolved conflict? Get away from the place that we kind of know, you know, hey, we're, 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 we're following God's will and we're where we need to be. How do we get over that hopelessness, so to speak? Well, verse 6, he begins to give us, I think, what is a great example of how we go there. And it's, and it's really the point of the message. We're coming to the point of the message today. It says this, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, now you, can, you can kind of substitute there at the end of verse 6 and beginning of verse 7. You kind of, kind of substitute humble with, with submit. All right? Then, then they're kind of interchangeable if you look at the, at the, at the original text. So, so you can kind of switch that. Think about that, that humility and that idea of submission. And this is really, this is really an important part. Um, it's essential. When we allow God's will to work in our lives. We get to that place and we allow God's will to work in our lives. Submission is hard to think about, isn't it? I mean, I mean, think about it. It's hard to think about submitting. Right? I mean, you think about submission and probably one of the images that comes to mind is like in marriage and all that. But, but just in, in life in general, remember the world that we live in tells us, as I said earlier, we're the master of our domain. We are, we are the ones who should choose what it is that we want and where we go. So when you think about submission, giving, giving control of, of, of what you're doing in your life to someone else, that's a hard thing to think about. I know it is for me because I'm kind of an independent kind of person. And I, and, I, and I like to think that I know what's, what's best for me and I want to do what I want to do, right? When's the time that you probably made the most mistakes in your life? Think about it. When did you probably make the biggest or the most mistakes? Probably when you were a teenager. And those of you who are teenagers, you're getting ready to make them. Um, but or, or possibly when you were in college, right? And why is that? Why is it that that was the time that you probably made the biggest mistakes? Why? I would venture to guess it's because you already knew everything, right? Right? I mean, really, I mean, I've just gotten, I've just gotten dumber over the years. Because when I was 17, I knew everything. You couldn't tell me anything. There was nothing, I, I mean, you can ask my parents or, uh, or my dad. Uh, you know, when I was 17, I, I knew it all. I knew everything there was to know. And I'd say a lot of us have been in that boat before. We knew it all. We, nobody could tell us anything. And, and submitting to authority was just the most, was the furthest thing from our mind, right? I mean, it's like, you know, I, I deal with teenagers every day, and it's kind of, it's funny to watch them. Um, you know, we, we kind of sit back and chuckle about some of the things they do. You're not to their face, but, you know, uh, we're nice about it. We, won't, we don't make fun of them. But, um, but they make these decisions, and they think, oh, they just, they just got everything figured out. And if, and if we would listen, you ever been to that place where somebody wiser, more experienced than you, kind of said, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you might want to think about that a little bit more. And, and, and a year later, you realize that was a mistake, right? It's hard for us. It's hard for us to submit. It's hard for us to let someone else make decisions in our lives. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on teenagers or college kids, but it is kind of the time to make a lot of mistakes. But I think all of us are like that. And there's been times in my adult life that I went to my father or my mother was alive. I would go to her and I would say, what do you think about this? And they say, you know, no, I don't think that's a great idea. I think you need to, to rethink that. And I went ahead and did it anyway. And, you know, six months later, I would eat crow and say, you were right, I should have done that. But it's hard for us to submit. It's hard for us to humble ourselves because, because that's what the world is putting on us. We're not, at times, we're not ready to listen. You know, there's another piece in that, in that verse that talks about resist. Now, the, there's an inter interesting, I guess, dichotomy here. You have, you have this idea of submitting and being humble, and then he follows that up with resist the devil, right? And there's a, there's a, a forceful action there. There's flee. There's an actual fight, right? You're resisting the devil. And here's the thing. There, there really is no middle ground. It, it, either you're submitting, if you're submitting yourself and you're humbling yourself to God's will and you're letting God's will lead in your life, then you are resisting the devil. There, there, it's, it's, it, there's, no, there's not a whole lot of middle ground here. There really isn't any. So when we, when we talk about how do we get to this place, how do we resolve that conflict, how do we really begin to let faith work in our lives, he gives us the first couple steps. 
Submit and resist. Submit to God's will, humble yourself, and resist the devil. A lot of us maybe aren't at that place just yet. Maybe that's a place that you need. Maybe there's a place where you need to ask Christ into your life and say, I want you in my life. I want to do your will. I want to be saved by the grace that you have given us. And maybe you're at that place right now. Maybe you haven't gotten there yet, right? Maybe you haven't submitted and begun to resist. But maybe you have. Maybe you have. Um, and, and, you're, and you're really struggling with that place. Maybe you're, maybe you're struggling with that aspect. And I've submitted and I want to do God's will and I believe. I've accepted Christ into my life. How do, I, how do I get to that next step? Well, the next verse in verse 8 is really kind of the key verse for us today. And this is the place. This is the one that's going to encourage all of us. It's going to encourage all of us. Whether you're at that place where you haven't submitted yet or whether you have submitted and you're still having trouble living these things out in your life. And this is where verse 8 comes in. It says this. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. This verse speaks deeply into communion with God. Now we know, when I say communion, I know the first thing that comes to your mind, and it's the... the the, the act that we do here that represents Christ's sacrifice and we honor him through our take, taking the bread and the cup, um, that's communion. But in this particular case, and I think this is on your listening guides, um, communion is more. It's about sharing intimate thoughts and feelings on a spiritual level. Communion is about sharing intimate thoughts and feelings on a spiritual level. This is a great promise that we have from God. It's a great promise that we have from God. That if we seek Him, if we, if we draw near to Him, then He will reward us. He will, he, his presence will be with us. That's a promise from God. Now, now here's the thing. When we talk about drawing near, I've got to go back just a second. I want to talk a little Old Testament here with you for a minute. In the Old Testament, the communion, the idea of communion with God didn't actually begin this way. Okay, it didn't actually begin like this. Drawing, drawing near to God originally was connected to the Levitical priests. And if we go back to Exodus, if you read in Exodus 19, you see a good example of this. Uh, Moses is at Mount Sinai, and, and he's, he's, he's communing with God. He's speaking with God. And God is very clear, though. He tells, all, he tells him to tell all the other Israelites, don't come near the mountain. Don't come here. Do not come close here physically. Because I was, he, he, he'll wipe you out. He will, just, he will kill you immediately. Do not come to this place. In, in verse uh, 22, in uh, chapter 19, we read this. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. So this idea, if, if you look back in verse 8, it talks about the hand washing. And drawing close to God. It was a whole different sort of uh, meaning in the Old Testament uh, at this particular time. There was a lot of hand washing that was done by the priests in the tabernacle. They were constantly washing their hands to purify themselves. Washing their feet. Uh, being anointed with oil. There was this whole process, right, that they were going through. And, 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 and then you have this idea of, of common folks. How was it that they drew near to God? Well, well when they built the tabernacle... Um, there, were, there were different places in the tabernacle and the common folks like you and I, we really couldn't actually go back into the Holy of Holies. We actually would just kind of hang in the courtyard and we would bring our sacrifices and, and give those to the priests. And then the priests would offer those sacrifices for us. They would actually get to go behind the curtain, right? And, and they, would, they would offer those sacrifices there so that that, that physical coming close to God was, was limited. There was limited access. For the, for the common folk at that particular time, right? And then, and then really the high priest could only, would be the only one who could actually enter the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And, they, and, and would only do this once a year. So there was this whole process. So, so in the Old Testament, a believer could only draw so close to God's physical presence. And then he had to have someone represent them further on. But the thing about it is this all changed. This all changed for all of us. Coming closer to God came to describe anyone's approach to God. Anyone's approach to God. The tabernacle and the temple and, and, and this particular Levitical priest system, it became unnecessary. 
how will it become unnecessary? Well, let's look at Hebrews. The author of Hebrews is describing this scenario in chapter 7. And in discussing the Levitical priests and the change that has come. And we pick up in verse 19 and we see this. We read, For the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which, listen to this, we draw near to God. The old law made nothing perfect, but now there is a better hope. And through that hope, we draw near to God. What is that better hope? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Very simple. Look down at verse 23 and read this. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. The priests that were there, they died. They, they all, they were humans. They, they died, right? And there, and there were more priests that came. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection made the, that old system irrelevant. Now, we can draw near to God through Christ. Now, our relationship with God is, is, is cemented through our faith in Jesus Christ. In, in Hebrews 10, starting verse 19, we see this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Drawing near to God is really the essence of Christianity as compared to this Levitical system. It becomes the essence of Christianity. It gets me to our bottom line here today. It says, when we get close to God, we have the greatest opportunity to live out our faith and be what he intended us to be. When we get close to God. And here's the thing. And you really you really have to understand this. Okay? If you don't feel like that, that, we, that you can get close to God. If you don't feel like right now that you're close to God. If you don't feel like that, that currently in, in the choices that you've made in your life. The place that you're at in your life. If you just, just don't feel like that you're not good enough. And you can't take that first step to get close to God. Here's the thing. God took the first step already. He already took the first step. You don't have to. He's already taken. As Gary was saying earlier, even the times that you think he's not there, he's always in there. He always will be there. He has taken that first step. Jesus is the greatest example of a holy, all-powerful God making the first steps into the lives of of fallen, sinful people like you and me. When we choose daily how close we want to be, whether we are getting closer or whether we're not. And the thing is, when we draw close to Him, it prepares us for what it is that He has to say. It prepares our hearts to receive that. And then it gives us the courage to go live. Because that's, that's where we ultimately one day. We receive that courage. Drawing near to God leads us to serving others. We've talked about, we, unfortunately, we had some weather yesterday, got canceled. We've talked a lot about serving the city. Drawing closer to God leads us to go and serve, to be there, to do those things for other people. You won't be perfect when this happens. You won't be. So stop waiting. Stop waiting to draw closer to God when you're, when you're perfect. Eric said it perfectly in, in his video earlier. We cannot make God love us any more or any less. He said that perfectly. We cannot. We don't have to have it all together to be closer to Him. We don't have to wait to draw closer to Him. He's there. And he's already taken the first step. 
At the bottom of your list, guy, I put some blanks just for some ideas. You know, how does that, how does that getting closer look in our lives? And then really, we talk, we talk very simple. I mean, I mean, first, prayer, right? Community and prayer. And, and, and I just encourage you, if you don't have a, a time every day when you are spending time quietly with God in prayer, make that time. Make a quiet time every day. Every day. Take a time out, Right? I mean, I listen, I'm as busy as anybody. I'm as guilty as anybody. So I'm good. I'm sitting down for this message. You know, it, it, it's a struggle sometimes. But that's where we draw closer to God. That's one of the steps in drawing closer to God. Find a quiet time to meditate, to study, to pray. Reading the scripture. We've talked about this many times. And, and, and sometimes we talk about it. I think we, we kind of overlook it. But, but, but truly, if we're going to understand God's will and God's mind, he's given it to us. Let's read it. Let's study. Spend that time each day. Worshiping. Coming here on, 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 on uh, Sunday mornings or in our community groups, but worshiping. Even if it's just, I know a lot, and not a lot of folks do this, and, and I've heard some funny stories about this, you know, uh, singing in, in, in your car, right? Singing and people looking at it, it's like, what are they singing about? You know, what the, you know, and just singing songs of praise to God. Worshiping. And then also serving. Serving is a way that we draw closer to God as well. Be willing to step out and serve people who, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, people who really maybe can't, can't do anything for us and can't give us anything back. Those are just some examples and just some ideas. That's why I put that blank at the bottom of your list of guys. Just some ideas to take forward. But I encourage you to at least take one and begin if you're not doing those already. If you're doing one, then, then, then look and see if there's another thing that, that, that we want to that God is leading us to do. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's spending more time in prayer. Maybe it's spending more time studying the scripture. But all these things will help us draw close to God. So, so as we go through and we talk about a faith that works, how does it become second nature to us? It becomes second nature when we draw ourselves close to God. And it just, it just comes through our hand, manifests itself through our hands, through our feet, through our daily actions. Everything Let's pray God uh, We thank you again For your word We thank you for, uh, for Really giving us The insight That we need To understand what it is that you have us do in our lives And, uh, and God I'm just thankful That um, That you are always there And even at times that that we don't feel like, that I don't feel like, that I'm worthy and, and, and can take that step to get closer to you, God. The fact that by sending your son to die for our sins, you've already taken that first step. You've given us, you've given us that sacrifice. You've given us that step through his blood, that way to draw close to you, to come to you through your son. God, we praise you. And we honor you for that because we know there's nothing that we can do, God, to make you love us more or less because you love us in a way that we cannot comprehend in our minds. A love that we don't even have words to understand. And I pray for each of us as we go forward, God, as, as, as things in this church are, are beginning to change, as some incredible decisions are being made, I ask that not only for, for all of us, but for the church as well, that we continue to draw close to you and that everything that we do be based on, on what you would have us do, what your will is for us as individuals and for us as this church. You have blessed us so much beyond what we ever deserve, God. Uh, we want to do this for you. We want to we glorify your name. We want to grow your kingdom. And, um, and I thank you so much the people, for the leadership in this church. I thank you so much for all these people who have chosen to come and worship here uh, together and do these things for you in this community. And God, we, just, we ask that we continue 